Hello folks! Today we're going to talk about descriptive writing. Descriptive writing is something that we all have to do to make our writing uh, clearer and more understandable to other people. Let's get started. Descriptive writing is not just for poetry. We use this in all kinds of writing uh, for personal and professional reasons as well. Uh, descriptive writing is more than simply just adjectives and adverbs um, because there is a, certainly a limit to using those. Uh, and we'll talk about a number of different ways that we can describe things today. Uh, descriptive writing adds information that's necessary for the reader to understand the context and emotions and the point of view of the author. Uh, because in writing, well, we don't really have that back and forth interaction where you can clarify what you mean. And so when we write, we have to make things as descriptive as possible so people understand you. So we're going to talk about a number of different types of descriptive writing. We'll talk about, of course, adjectives and adverbs. Those are the things that you think about the most in description. Uh, we're also going to talk about descriptive nouns and descriptive verbs. These are not necessarily special verbs and nouns, just a class of verbs and nouns that um, differ from normal or standard or common words. We'll talk also about phrases uh, and clauses. Of course, these are things that we use to add more description than one word can provide. And we'll talk a little bit about similes and metaphors. And while we don't use these a lot in our academic writing, we certainly do use them a little bit. So let's get moving on to adjectives. An adjective describes a noun. That's simple enough. Uh, they can be single words or phrases. You can have an, you can have an adjective clause or phrase. Uh, there's a great list of adjectives if you click on this link, right? So if you download this PowerPoint, which I really recommend that you do because there are a lot of links in this PowerPoint, uh, download the PowerPoint from the webs from the class website, and click on the list of adjectives, and you can see it's just a wonderful, huge list of adjectives that you can refer to for your own writing. Most importantly, when we're using adjectives, uh, there is a particular adjective order. Uh, adjective order is very important. It's not the kind of thing that native speakers generally think about because adjective order is, well, just kind of natural for native speakers. Um, but, and most native speakers probably couldn't even tell you what the adjectives or adjective order is, but uh, they certainly will recognize when it's wrong. So it's something that you have to memorize and practice using. So the adjective or order here is uh, determiners, observation, size and shape, age, color, origin, material, and qualifier. Now, you most likely will not use all of these at once. That's unusual and probably bad writing. However, regardless of how many you use, you should still try to keep them in this order. So one of the examples using all of these is a beautiful, big, round, old, brown, Italian leather dinner jacket. So why don't you take a moment to take a look at that list, maybe write it down, take some notes. Uh, this is something that you very much should be using in your own writing. Now, adjective use with countable and uncountable nouns. Uh, of course, a countable noun is one that you can count, something that has a plural and singular. Uncountable nouns just have one form, right? Uh, obviously, one of the most popular examples is something like water, fluids. You know, fluids are generally uncountable, right? Take a look at some of these examples here. Some and any. How would you use these with countable or uncountable? Much, many, little, few, a lot of, lots of, a little bit of, plenty of, enough, no. So can I have some water? Certainly, absolutely. So you can use that with countable and uncountable. However, there can also be some cars on the road or some people in the room. And so some in that case doesn't mean a little bit of, it means a few or a couple, a number, a small number. Do you have any questions? Well, any there would certainly be used with the plural, and so that could be countable, right? Uh, I don't want any water. That's also okay as well. So these can be used in both. Much many, however, cannot. 
Much is it used with uncountable and many is used with countable. So I don't have much money, however I have many friends. Well, okay, maybe not, but that's just an example. Little few. Now this should be used, uh, th this should be differentiated, sometimes it's not, sometimes people use them for both countable and uncountable, but they really should be differentiated. So I have little money, that doesn't mean small money, that just means not much, right? And I have few friends. Okay. A lot of and lots of can be used for both, and those are relatively interchangeable. A little bit of, so I have a little bit of money, but I don't have a little bit of friends. So a little bit of is going to be used with uncountable nouns. Plenty of. Well, I have plenty of money and plenty of friends. Okay, I don't really have plenty of money. I wish I did. Hmm. But it can be used with both countable and uncountable. Plenty of. Enough. So I have enough money and I have enough friends. Hmm, enough friends. Does that sound right? Enough friends. I suppose you could have that. You can have enough friends. I could have enough cars. It sounds a little awkward though, but it certainly can be used. So you can use enough with both countable and uncountable. And no, I have no money and no friends. So both of those are okay as well. Let's move on. So adverbs. Adverbs, adverbs describe verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Uh, there's differences certainly between adjectives and adverbs primarily because uh, adverbs don't describe nouns. Now however they describe adjectives sometimes which describe nouns. That gets a little confusing. There's a nice list of adverbs here and so if you have the PowerPoint presentation please click on that and take a look at it. There are many different kinds of adverbs. We have adverbs of manner, so how something was done. She moved slowly and spoke quietly, so how she spoke, how she moved. Adverbs of place. Adverbs of place means the location, where they're at. She has lived on the island all her life. She still lives there now. Adverbs of frequency, how often, right? So she takes the boat to the mainland every day. She often goes by herself. Adverbs of time, so time doesn't just mean, you know, on the clock, but also time during the day or time in comparison with something else. She tries to get back before dark. It's starting to get dark now. She finished her tea first. She left early. All of those are adverbs of time. And lastly, adverbs of purpose. She drives her boat slowly to avoid hitting the rocks. She shops in several stores to get the best buys. Okay, so in order to do something. Adverbs of purpose. I really love this example. And so if you have the uh, PowerPoint presentation, I, I suggest you, you click on that and take a look. There's a whole series of these uh, videos that played when I was a young kid uh, from this organization called Schoolhouse Rocks. And they did a lot of educational content uh, some of it was grammar based, some of it was civics, you know, about government and so forth. And there's a couple of them in this presentation that I, I think you'd enjoy. So go ahead and click on that. I love hearing about Lolly's adverbs. Lolly, 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 get your adverbs here. Go ahead, check it out. Uh, also, you can see that there are some lyrics that you can check out the lyrics as well if it's difficult to understand what they're saying, singing. Descriptive nouns. Like I said, descriptive nouns aren't really that special necessarily. Uh, they're just more descriptive. They're, they're less general. So descriptive nouns are simply nouns that are specific to the objects being described, uh, particularly categories. So we have things like job titles. Now in Korea, you use job titles all the time, much more so than, than English-speaking countries do, especially America. Um, and so job titles like manager, conductor, you have characteristics, characteristics like laggard or drunkard. Uh, laggard is someone who lags behind, who's slow. A drunkard is someone who tends to be drunk often. And nouns as metaphors like pixie, troll, flower. Uh, some of you might have heard the term troll in regards to the internet or to computers in the internet. Well, obviously it's not really some ugly monster 
though. Mm, we never know who's behind that keyboard. But a troll is someone on the internet who likes to go into some place and make bad comments and get people upset or excited. Okay. So these are just a, a few different examples of how we can use descriptive nouns. Uh, they're better than using things like guy, man, boy, all right? Because those are a little bit too general. We can make the sentence more descriptive by being more specific. Descriptive verbs are uh, quite similar in this way. Is that they're, they're not exactly special. They're just something that is maybe more descriptive, uh, that has a more specific meaning, right? And so uh, there's a nice list here called the vivid verbs list, and I'll show you some of them on the next page here. So with these descriptive verbs, uh, they just tell you a little bit more about well, about how something is being done without having to use an adverb. So for example, on this side, on the left side, there is uh, some kind of basic or general verbs. And on the right side, there's a, a bunch of other ones. I'd like you to try to match the ones on the left and the ones on the right. Now, we could also do this in class. But for example, with the word tell, well, what kind of descriptive verbs can you use that are different than just tell? Well. You have ones here like exclaim, insist, mm, whisper, and instruct. Oh, and forgot mention as well. So see if you can match some of these other ones with their more descriptive verbs on the right. So why don't you pause now or something and, and see how you do that. We could also talk about that in class. No, I said pause and do it. Come on, listen to me. Hee <laughs> hee. All right, let's move on. Okay, so then we move on to phrases and clauses. Uh, there are many types of phrases and clauses that can add description to your writing. Generally, phrases are collections of words that form a single unit. Uh, they can have nouns or verbs, but they do not have a subject with a verb, or more specifically, a subject and a predicate. Clauses are groups of words with subjects and verbs, or again, more specifically, subject and predicate. You have an independent clause. An independent clause can stand alone. It doesn't need anything else with it. A uh, dependent clause cannot stand alone. So, for example, an independent clause is, I like ice cream. A dependent clause could be, uh, because it's sweet. Now, because it's sweet, can't stand alone, so I have to add it to the independent clause, right? So, I like ice cream because it's sweet. All right. So, more specifically, phrases here. Uh, prepositional phrases, a preposition plus a noun or a noun phrase. In the back, around the corner, on a mountain. These are pretty simple. I think you know all of these. There's a nice list of prepositions at this link here if you have the PowerPoint. Verb phrases, uh, verb plus auxiliary. So you have infinitive phrases. The bear tried to eat me, to, right? Ger uh, gerund phrase, this raging fire has already destroyed our home. A participial phrase, reading about the protests, I suddenly had the urge to donate money. Ushered to the front of the room, the man began to speak. Okay. Now again, Schoolhouse Rocks has a very fun video about prepositional phrases. I really do recommend that you watch these. They're a lot of fun. Clauses. Again, you have the independent clause, a complete sentence with a subject and a verb. I ate a hamburger. It doesn't need anything else. It can exist on its own. Dependent clause, used to add information to the independent clause cannot stand alone and maintain the same meaning. So, because I was hungry, I ate a hamburger. You have adjective clauses. A clause that modifies a noun or a pronoun. So, joined with who, whose, whom, which, or that. The man who sang the best was the winner. So, who sang the best, the man who sang the best is an adjective clause. Adverb clause, joined with subordinate conjunctions. Uh, as, when, where, while, if, and so forth. He jumped as the car hit the curb. So as the car hit the curb, he jumped. So it's describing the verb here. 
adverb clause. A noun clause that she wanted ice cream was a surprise to me. Now, of course, this also for, uh, forms a subject as well here. That she wanted ice cream was a surprise to me. Also, let's talk about essential and non-essential clauses, also referred to as defining and non-defining clauses, or restrictive and non-restrictive clauses. I, honestly, I don't understand why they are called so many different things. Uh, I, I've never seen a difference between them, but maybe you can educate me. Uh, essential clauses have required information to identify the noun. So it's, it, it's essential. It's required. You, you can't get rid of it. So the man who gave me a ride is in the back of the room. So what it's doing right here is the man who gave me a ride is identifying the person. It's not extra information. It's not the man who gave me a ride is in the back of the room, of course. So essential and non-essential uh, clauses are, are pronounced differently. You, you can kind of imagine that there are commas around them, and so there's a pause in front of it and behind it. In this case, it's an essential clause. So the man who gave me a ride is in the back of the room. No pause. Non-essential clauses provide extra information that is really not required or not essential. So Bill Clinton, who I did not vote for, turned out to be a pretty good president. Bill Clinton, who I did not vote for, turned out to be a pretty good president. Now again, notice the way I'm saying that. I got a little pause before and after that clause. But I could take that clause out completely and it, it really means about the same. Bill Clinton turned out to be a pretty good president. And lastly, relative clauses. Who, whom, whoever, whomever, who's, that, and which. Uh, relative clauses are used, well, quite frequently throughout. Relative clauses can be restrictive or non-restrictive. Um, people disagree on this somewhat, but uh, who and whom and whoever and whomever and whose uh, can all be used in both ways as restrictive or non-restrictive clauses. That and which is disagreed upon quite a bit. Um, I would argue that that should be used with restrictive clauses and which should be used with non-restrictive clauses. However, uh, th again, there is disagreement out there and so mm, essentially you can probably do either one you want unless you follow a style guide that tells you differently. So positives. Uh, positives are non-essential clauses and you can, you can tell that by looking at the examples and seeing how they're offset with commas. Uh, we do that when it's non-essential. So the first one is a parenthetical. Uh, Mark, the dirty slob, didn't even do the dishes after dinner. So this is used to give the off, uh, author a chance to kind of describe or pro provide extra information about the character they're describing. Or contrast, pop music, though catchy, is terrible. Right. And a positive adjectives, so more information or emphasis to the description. The train, sleek and shiny, was making its first run. And lastly here, I'll talk very briefly about similes and metaphors. Of course, similes and metaphors are, are pretty similar. Similar, simile. Uh, similes, they specifically and explicitly use a word that means like or as, similar to, and so forth. So the cloud was like a little puppy. All right, so you're just comparing the cloud to a puppy, or at least the cloud looks like a puppy. Metaphor, however, does not explicitly use one of those comparing words, and what it does instead is it equates one thing to another. So, the cloud was a puppy. Like that. Now, we use metaphors in many ways. Uh, we use metaphors even to describe your computer. On your computer, you work on a desktop. You open a file. Um, you, you have a document. These are all metaphors. These are all things that were brought from the business world into the computer. And they used metaphors to make it easier for people to understand or relate to their, to their work life, really, which is where, the com where computers started in business settings. In, uh, in academics or you know, academic writing, we use similes quite a bit to try to make it easier for people to understand what something is, uh, especially when you're doing deep description about the senses, what it smells like, what it looks like, what it feels like. We use similes often in those situations. Metaphors probably uh, quite a bit less. Uh, in general, I would probably 
recommend that you don't use metaphor in most academic writing unless it's extremely common or accepted. Okay, so here are some sample descriptive paragraphs. I, so you need the PowerPoint for this. Go ahead and download them and, and take a look. Um, obviously, in our class this time, we're going to be doing an essay and not, not paragraphs. But these will give you a good, um, a good model for how you're, you're writing the individual paragraphs themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about the essay format. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up with that today. Uh, I'll see you in class, and I want you to make sure to take a look at the, at the PowerPoint, uh, because like I said, there are a lot of links that you can follow, and there's a lot of information that you can get in there that you can't get from this video. So, see you later. Bye-bye.